Hey, what's happening, everybody? I'm uh, glad to have you back. Just wanted to give you a little heads up about the garden and what we have going on here as uh, people start to drift in. Um, things are going well here. I think if you guys saw my last video, I put uh, a bunch of those uh, feminized seed, which I've never used before. I've never popped any feminized seed. Um, I got those uh, in Jiffy those little jiffy pellet pucks. I haven't used those in about a decade, but I soaked those in aloe water, Sheila G, and uh, and and let them soak up. And uh, now we've got over half of the seeds have popped already. Um, I'm gonna take a little video tomorrow, show you guys what's up. Um, I finished my all my reamending process and I top dressed with, uh, um, with some fresh barley straw. And like I said, I'll, I'll show you guys all that in the new video as we get ready to drop the new little transplants into the soil. And I think next time I'm going to just, if I ever went uh, feminized again, we'd go seed straight to soil. Um, but I had to re-amend this cycle, so I wanted to play it safe. Uh, but it looks like uh, we got people pouring in, and that's good. I'm glad people are coming back. I got a lot of really positive feedback on the first, on the first session, and I think... Uh, you know, it gave me some motivation to move forward. I was uh, a little hesitant, but uh, uh, it seems like um, seems like it's a good thing. So uh, anyway, today we were just going to continue. I wanted to kind of do my disclaimer again. The we're <laughs> by no means am I an expert or a professional or a master, and uh, all I can do is share my experience and observations with you. And what's worked for me and my goal in this whole process is to uh, kind of walk you through the cycle that I've gone through and I'm getting a gram a watt, two pounds of light, uh, and it's doable with fresh water only. And, and that's it during the growth cycle, your only input, you, it can be done. And, and you don't have to sacrifice quality uh, to make that happen. So uh, this, this particular talk like i said i really wanted to break things down and i know a lot of a lot of you guys that are on here viewing it live know this information already i really appreciate you coming out because you know it's it can be redundant the information can be redundant but i'm really targeting people who've never done no-till who want to go the simple route and go take the minimalist approach as i'm doing and uh so that's my goal here there's a lot of a lot of add-ons that can be done to my method but all i can do is speak to speak to my experience and and you know otherwise i'd just be kind of faking it and uh we don't do that so um anyway i think we're going to go right on to like cover crop the cover crop uh aspect because we touched on the soil and uh, the importance of having a living viable soil uh and that that's really the magic that's that's the engine that drives this whole thing is the soil so um cover crops are, are kind of one of the most uh commonly misunderstood aspects to no-till i think for the beginner for somebody who's never heard of no-till because they immediately think that they're going to compete with resources in a sense and uh that that uh that's that that's, that's a misnomer and i think what there's a lack of understanding with what's happening with the root system. And as I've said, a lot of you guys know this stuff already, but uh, we're going to break it down from square one for the people that don't. And so I think we need to talk about root exudes and the fact that um, your plant root system isn't just a straw that sucks up. It's, it also exudes things and, and it exudes vitamins and sugars and enzymes and all of these things we could go into those individually and talk about the importance of each one of them to the soil structure and what they do but you know at the basic most dumbed down level those sugars and enzymes and vitamins help attract various microbes that help break up the nutrients and minerals and make them more bioavailable to the plants so if you have a more diverse group of cover crops that are actually exuding a diverse uh, 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 in diverse group of vitamins and enzymes and the sugars that we've been talking about 
uh, you're going to have a, a, a more diverse bacterial colony in your in your beds. And so all, that, that diversity is going to equate to better nutrient uptake and uh, more, more nutrients that are readily available. So the cover crop, to me, that's the most important aspect is the root exudes and, and kind of enriching the soil in that, in that regard. Now there's also other um, aspects of certain cover crop like legumes and, and, and whatnot that are actually nitrogen fixers. And these will literally pull nitrogen out of the air and, and fix it into into the soil into a a, a, a a bioavailable form for the plant. So we've actually done a test at one of the places that I was working with. We uh, got some build a soil soil tested it before we planted anything in it. I just that when we just put the beds in, we tested the soil for all all its nitrogen levels and whatnot. And then we tested it at the end of the growth cycle, and it actually had higher nitrogen levels than when we started. And we had and we had gone a full three month cycle of veg, one month veg, and two months of bloom, and and had had higher numbers at the end. So um, that's a real testament to the power of the cover crop and the living cover crop, and and what they can do for your soil and and the real importance. Um, this time I've got my my lady Lacey here with me. She's going to be kind of going helping me out with some of your guys' questions. I realized last time that I just blabbed through it. And I and I missed a lot of your questions, so I'm I'm kind of hoping to streamline that a little more. Uh, nitrogen fixers, those are all any of the legumes. So you know, clo clover is actually really good, um, and I believe vetch is another uh, good nitrogen fixer. Uh, but clover tends to be the most popular, and it it's uh, it, it grows really vigorous, and and I it's one of those ones that really take over in my beds. I'm sure you've seen some of my pics on IG. So um, any of the clovers would be would be great for nitrogen fixing. Where are your thoughts on the cover crop from Build-A-Soil? Uh, the Build-A-Soil cover crop, I really like it. Uh, once again, it fits that kind of diverse profile that I was just talking about. Some people are kind of hating on it because of the climbing. They've got some climbers in there. And, you know, I, <clears throat> I, I don't find them to be that much of a problem, I think. I think they're kind of it's kind of cool aesthetically when they when they climb up through the canopy and when, if they start to be problematic like latching onto a bud or something I'll just yank them and then just throw them down as a mulch layer. Uh, so I like I, I can't say enough about build the soil. They're a, they've got a really good resource. Their website is uh, you know it's not the slickest website in the world, but it's full of information and uh, those guys are always eager to help. So. so Okay, so yeah, I think moving on, I think we cover, that covers the cover crop, you know, and there's the obvious benefits as well as moisture retention and, and, and that kind of thing. And um, you can get by with a living cover crop being your only kind of mulch source, but it has to be fairly dense. And I've found from my experience that once you get a canopy over it, you get a pretty good die off, which is cool. Um, it just all breaks down and goes the nutrients go back into the soil in a kind of a closed loop but i do still use barley straw as well so i'll do like a living cover crop and then let that sprout up and then use a barley straw over it water the barley over the barley straw and then cover crop seeds into the barley straw so we've i, I get that enzymatic and, and response from all the seeds sprouting inside the at, at the soil level and then there's a kind of a die off from the mulch layer being put down and then there's a new kind of resurgence with the new cover crop. It seems a little redundant, but uh, it's what I've been doing the past few cycles and I've been getting really good results. So I'm kind of not rocking the boat uh, in that regard. So uh, that's that's the long and short of cover crops. You know, I don't think anybody has any questions with that. We're going to move on like the, and, and we kind of covered mulching too. What's up? How thick of a layer as far as the barley straw? Mm -hmm. Barley straw, it, it varies. You know, I, I think, you know, I, I like, I don't know, eighth inch, half inch thick, a, a fairly decent layer. You know, I, I like to be able to pull it back and see a bunch of fung, fungal activity happening and, and the worms right at the surface. So I'm really trying to eliminate a lot of air that's circulating above it from getting down there because we do want 
the, we do want some decomposition going on underneath that layer. So I think it, it's got to be thick enough to facilitate some decomposition, right? Um, so anyway, I think uh, mulch, that, that really covers the mulch. I, I'd like to take when my cover crop gets big, like the clover gets crazy and out of hand or it's just everywhere, I'll just take some scissors and, and trim it down and give it a haircut, break it up and throw it in as mulch and it just goes back in for the worms. And, and like I said, it's another closed loop in a sense. Uh, the nutrients just go right back, right back to the plant. What about wood chips as mulch? Um, wood chips, I don't have any experience with them per se. And, and to be honest with you, in the past, I've always heard that they were a no-no, that they could rob nitrogen from your soil. But that's just kind of me hearing old farmers talking, you know, it has no, it's not rooted in any experience. So um, I've heard lots of people saying wood chips are just fine and that they actually promote uh, bacterial and fungal colonies. So that might be some for some of you guys that have experience. I'd love to hear your input on that. Um, I'm hesitant because I've been told it's a no-no. Some of you might actually have science behind it to know whether it's a good or a bad thing or not. I'm not using mulch. I just use my canvas leaves and we'll throw in some kale. Is it bad to throw in kale for mulch and food? No, I, I wouldn't say so. I mean, as long as the kale was grown good, you know, you weren't growing it with miracle Grow or something. Uh, any kind of nutrient source that, that you can get, get to your plants uh, via your soil, it, I would think is a good one, you know, minus, yeah, I mean, I, I can't think of how kale could be bad. Rice holes. Um, rice holes are actually really good for aeration, um, but they actually break down pretty fast. So uh, I don't know as a mulch layer, I imagine they would work good. Uh, you would just have to use quite a bit of them and then just anticipate them to break down you know, more rapidly than say the barley straw. Okay, okay so um, well, I think we should move on to the, mu the must-have inputs. And these are the I call them must-haves because in my minimalist approach, I still enrich my soil in between the cycles. And I think that that's really important because we can't escape that, the fact that the soil, once again, is the engine. And if we, you know, leave it in disrepair, it's the finished product is, is going to, is going to show, is going to show that. And so we really want to, um, stick to that truth and understanding that the soil that we've got to keep the soil alive and we've got to feed the soil the things that it needs so it can provide for the plant via that sacred union right so um the inputs that i use so now after i've just harvested i will uh i don't re-amend with that kiss pack that you use you may have seen in my last video every cycle um they recommend that you do but i've been doing it every other cycle and things have been going okay so um, what I'll do after this, after the harvest is there's kind of a week long period where I'm doing my dry and cure and I don't really have the space to keep my room up and going like in veg condition. So it kind of, the temperatures drop and things go dormant for about a week. And I really worry that some of my microbial life suffers at that time. So I will hit it with an uh, active compost tea, like uh, with OG BioWar. And I've got links in the description of uh, some of these inputs that I'm talking about and like this build a soil seed, uh, uh, not seed sprout, but uh, compost tea recipe and whatnot. So if you uh, need those things, there, there's links in the description to these inputs that I'm talking about. Um, so anyway, I'll hit my beds with that active compost tea and that will kind of give a boost to the microbial uh, life and, and uh, kind of kickstart things again um, and then after that I'll start drenching with aloe and um, and uh, the malted grain tincture from uh, Mountain Organics and some of you guys may know may know that from IG or may know of them uh, but they've got a great aloe tincture and I don't think they're doing the malted grains one anymore but I, I think they've got a similar a similar product now once again, a lot of you guys know about the, the, the benefits of aloe and um, for the people that don't, there's, 
there's just a ton that I, I could really go on about aloe for a, a, quite a while, but I'll try to keep it brief and to the point. Um, aloe for gardening purposes is, is giant. It's rich in, in, in minerals, sugars, and vitamins. And, and uh, it's also got things like saponins, which are kind of cl a cleansing and antiseptic, has an antiseptic effect. So those are really good for cloning and keeping uh, your uh, the cutting site clean and whatnot. There's also sal salicylic acid, right? And that's an antibacterial and antifungal, um, which, uh, once again, works symbiotically with the good fungus and bacteria and attacks the, the, the bad stuff. So it's just one of those win-win deals in the garden. It's really good as a foliar and as a drench. Is malted green the same or similar to malted barley? Yeah, my understanding is that the, the, the malted grain and malted barley uh, is the same. Uh, it's just multiple grains that are uh, that are malted, and um, I want to go into the kind of the benefits of the malted tincture and the seed sprouting tea. For those of you that don't know, uh, kind of what's happening here is when you do a seed sprout tea, and like corn is a really popular one, uh, you'll take the se you'll take seeds and actually sprout them, and uh, until they get a you know, about a half inch long tail growing out of them, a root going. And what's what's inside that root is uh, growth hormones and on all kinds of things that are, are going to aid the plant in, in developing a healthy root structure. And it's just like a super shot of, of, of uh, hormones that are just uh, irreplaceable to the plant. You really, it's a really good thing to have. And so that's where that malted grain tincture comes in really good for the root zone um, and uh, that's one of those deals where I'll hit my beds once or twice during veg uh, just as a right before veg as a little as a drench when I'm planting the transplants in. What about using aloe juice the kind for human consumption? Um, I've, I've seen mixed <clears throat> mixed information about out using aloe for human consumption like what you can get at the vitamin store uh, like lily of the valley or whatnot. Um, that has a preservative in there, and I've been hesitant to use it in my beds because of the preservative, but I, I would use it as a foliar uh, just because I, obviously there's less, less chance of harm happening to the beds if it's just going on the surface of the leaf. Uh, somebody's asking what the saponin is. Mm -hmm. Okay, saponin, it's just another one of those uh, components of inside the aloe that has the kind of the cleaning and antiseptic effect. Like when we use aloe on, on, on our wounds, it's what makes it an effective cleaner. And so it, that helps in, in the plant world by, by like keeping the roots healthy and, and revitalized and whatnot. Just, just like if we had cuts and abrasions on us, of the plant tissues, it helps the plant tissues heal. Did you say aloe tincture? Is that in lieu of the actual aloe leaf or is one better than the other? Yeah, somebody's asking if the aloe tincture and actual aloe, uh, if one is better than the other. And, and my understanding of them, and, and I have a lot of trust in Mountain Organics, uh, they're a really reputable crew, and that guy is, uh, is a no-till master. I mean, he's he's been six years in the same uh, no-till beds or even like their containers. You know, six years, seventeen or eighteen cycles, and and so I, I I've got a lot of faith in in him and his process. And so my understanding is that the aloe from him is just a more stable version because it's suspended in a in a glycerin solution. And um, and so at that point, it's kind of more stable, more shelf stable, and highly concentrated. Uh, I still believe that if you were gonna, if you were using a fresh aloe, that you're you're going to have better properties in that fresh aloe. I just kind of opted to support a good company and have something that was shelf stable and easy to use, like two teaspoons per gallon type of thing. Okay. Okay. So I think we went over the seed sprouting tea and the malted grain tincture and, and, and the benefit of those enzymes. I mean, you can imagine the, you know, the whatever it is that you're sprouting, whether it's barley or whatever, that 
it's sprouting and all those little seeds that have little roots coming out of them now and we're just concentrating all those enzymes from the thousands of seeds that you have sprouting and now we're going to feed that back feed that all those enzymes into your plant into your bed and uh and you can imagine the the benefits that ensue um yeah somebody's asking if they're using the whole leaf is okay i I would say so. I mean, I think that anytime you can incorporate everything that, you know, the natural order has offered us in regard to, especially to, to aloe, uh, to, to use it. The only, the only negatives I've seen to using the whole part of the leaf is that I can't get it pureed good enough and it clogs my chapin sprayer. So I tend to just kind of fillet if I'm using and using the actual aloe because I can't, even with my Ninja Blender, I can't get it curate enough it still clogs my sprayer. Joshua Steenson, what is something you're excited about trying in the future? I also heard of you ground, if you ground the growing medium, the plant grows better and more. Hmm. Somebody's asking about what I'm excited about using in the future, I think cultivation wise. And then I also mentioned something about grounding the beds. Uh, I've never heard of grounding the beds. Uh, you know, we are all electric. This is an electric universe. So I think that I, I wouldn't poo poo that, you know, I've never heard of it. And you definitely got me interested. I, I would be uh, into checking that out. Um, you know, it makes sense if, if there's some kind of electrical stagnation happening and if we could facilitate, you know, cause I mean, that's how nutrients are, are taken up from my basic understanding is that there's a kind of a magnetic electrical uh, thing happening with positive and electrical charges and that's how nutrients are assimilated. So very interesting point. Uh, as far as uh, anything new and exciting, I'll be very honest with you. I've for a long time have been very hesitant about LEDs and I've been seeing some really interesting stuff from Bromouse and others, THC Titan and people that have been uh, just getting really nice results with LEDs. So um, that's kind of what I'm excited about. The new LED and light tech, the DIY light tech is really uh, exciting. I've got a lot to learn in that department. Um, but cultivation wise, I'm really just kind of digging my heels into this minimalist no till. When you like lollipop, and if you do, do you toss them leaves, pull down, or grind them? Uh, somebody's asking about when I trim up or lollipop. And I do, I do somewhat, I bring it up to the canopy level and then I kind of let the canopy go natural to some degree, not for any other reason, just, just so I'm just going with my gut. You know, uh, there's a lot of people that strip, strip all the way up and, and are really like uh, particular about how thin their canopy is and, and about removing leaves. And I'm just not one of those guys. Uh, and no, I don't, I don't mulch any of those leaves when they go back in. I, I might rip them up by hand if I've got a big lot of them, but I tend to just kind of let everything fall naturally. And um, once again, not for any other reason, but part laziness and, and, and just going with my gut, you know. I, um, I'm, I'm taking the minimalist thing really to heart. Like we're trying to, uh, I'm not trying to spend 15 hours in the, in the garden every day and I'm not trying to mix a thousand concoctions. Um, you know, once again, I just want to facilitate that sacred union. Do you feed in flower just water all the way through? Yeah, somebody's asking if I feed in flower or if I'm just straight water all the way through. And I, very literally, fresh water, that's it. As soon as plants go in, like I said earlier, I'll hit them with, uh, with the enzymes from uh, the malted grains and I'll hit them with a little aloe. Um, as a drench when I when I transplant, but after that, everything is fed via the blue mat drippers, and it's all fresh water only from that moment on. Um, nothing else hits the soil except for fresh water. Um, hey, awesome. Can you talk about a method of structuring as in topping off the Right, right. Uh, somebody's asking about um, a method of topping or or fimming or that you know fuck I missed technique or whatever. Uh, I I typically just kind of top once or twice as the plants are in veg and then just let them do their thing. Uh, 
Washington has changed our plant count numbers. And so I'll, I'll probably be doing a lot more topping and a lot more low stress training these next, this next cycle, because we're dealing with that plant count issue here. And um, we're really hoping for the home grow bill to pass and uh, that will allow us to kind of get back to some practical numbers. But, but until then uh, I will be doing some more topping, but there's no really method. I don't really, I just kind of pinch, you know, pinch that top growth. Like, like we've all read from Cervantes and Rosenthal and everybody else is still using that old technique. In the soil biology, turn the dirt and soil into a humic acid. Why would you want to destroy the biology? Okay, medically fit. When the soil biology turned the dirt and soil into humic acid, why would you want to destroy the biology? I guess I'm not following fit. Uh, hit me up with that again, because I'd really like to get to your question. Uh, maybe we might have a misunderstanding going on here. Do you do biodynamic inputs? Bio okay. Right. So yeah, if you guys have uh, specific questions for me, uh, make sure to tag me with the at Joshua Steensland. That way we can uh, we can get to specific questions, and I'm not jumping in on your guys' <laughs> Your guys' conversations there in chat. Do you do any feeding of FPJ or teas when your bed becomes established or water only? Okay, Andrew. Yeah, you're asking about any like fermented plant juice or anything like that. And no, I don't. I don't do any of those. I, I'm not familiar with any of that Korean natural farming stuff. And um, I'm interested. I think it's really cool, and I'm interested in trying some of those for my veggie, uh, my veggie garden this year. Um, but uh, inside for the cannabis, we really just really once again, I'm going to beat that minimalist drum. Uh, I just do the active compost tea kind of as a, a, a kickstart at the beginning, and then a, a, some enzymes from a seed sprout tea and whatnot, and some aloe, and that's it before we go in. Have you picked up maxi food uh, no, somebody's asking about the maxi blue mats. I haven't picked them up yet. Those are the ones that go deeper, I believe. Um, I'm still using the regular ones. I'm having pretty good results. My beds are one foot deep, and I don't have them all the way to the top, so I'm probably at a 10 inch depth. And I've been, I've, I've, we've been going pretty good so far, but I wouldn't mind getting some maxis for my outdoor, my outdoor beds. I forget, are you using worms? Yeah, Urban Farmer's asking if I'm using worms. I am. I use the red wigglers, and uh, I, I believe I got two kinds, the red wigglers and the Alabama jumpers, and I, they just worked at slightly different depths, um, but uh, that was kind of my understanding with those. But, yeah, I am using worms, and I'm actually thinking about introducing more uh, because um, I just I want to see more activity. Okay, we got some people asking about Sheila G. So I'll, I'll go ahead and move into that too. Um, <clears throat> Sheila G is kind of a, a new one in the cannabis world, from my understanding, in that uh, I think it's Plant and Prosper is, is one of those guys on IG who's a, a heavy promoter of it. And uh, I looked into it and was really impressed with uh, the mineral content. It's got 70 to 80 of the of of the minerals that we need and it's all in ionic form and um, there's humic and fulvic acids there's also natural sulfur uh, that occurs inside the Sheila G and trace amounts which makes it uh, beneficial in conjunction with aloe that has its anti you know the the salicylic acid combined with the sulfur in the Sheila G make it a fairly decent preventative maintenance or, or even like a, a dealing with a light outbreak of powdery mildew. Um, but uh, I've kind of spoke my piece on powdery mildew in the past. And, uh, I, uh, you know, I think if you've got powdery mildew, there's you've got other problems. But um, the Sheila G is one of those deals that I'm, I'm kind of using it as a replacement to the full power. I'm kind of not using the full power anymore because I I've been taking the Sheila G myself as a, as a supplement for me. And I'm just kind of like, if it's something that I can take I, and I can give to my plants, I'd rather go that route. I mean, I can't take a shot of the full power. <laughs> so, um, 
I just I just top dress my plants and put them into flower. Based on what you said, are you recommending water only moving forward? How about coconut? Okay, somebody's asking, uh, they said that they just flipped into flower and based on what I'm suggesting, if, if they should only do fresh water. Um, uh, and if coconut water is okay. Coconut water is certainly okay. And once again, I kind of I touched on it earlier that my minimalist approach is just kind of like a square one. You could do aloe and coconut water once a week. You know, you can hit it up with all these things as much as you want. Uh, it's, that's just based on your preference and, and what you want. I'm just... Uh, saying that you could do it less and still get two pounds of light um, if you're using double-ended like the Gavita and um, at least that because that's what I'm getting from my experience and so depending on how enriched your soil is and how amended your soil what what you've got in it by all means go go fresh water only um, you know uh, it just depends on how how rich your soil is what do you feel when you eat the shoes uh, when I eat the shilajee, at first I felt, uh, I did feel energy, I felt energized, and um, and just kind of like an alertness to it, and and, and ultimately, I, I've taken really small amounts, and so I just, it's the fact that I know that I'm taking in so, so many good rich minerals, and I usually take it with a glass of warm man, uh, manuka honey and lemon water, and uh, you know, I've just felt like an overall sense of more energy and, and, and more vitality, for sure. Uh, somebody's asking if I've ever tried structuring water. Uh, no, and I've heard about that. I believe it's where it, it, you take the water and run it, <clears throat> run it through some kind of like spiral and it realigns the molecules. I think that's really interesting uh, stuff, but I haven't really dove into that. Um, uh, once again, that's one of those things about science that I find really interesting, but just haven't haven't uh, haven't dove into that topic yet. Uh, Urban's asking what Sheila do you taste like? It tastes like shit. It tastes like complete shit, uh, and it smells like bong water. I mean, it's 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 the most vile shit on the planet. Um, and if any of you don't know what it is, basically. Uh, it, it, it comes out of the Himalayas and some of these other high altitude mountain ranges where when they were formed, uh, they plowed in a, a bunch of tropical vegetation. And then as the mountain ranges were formed, it just kind of turned into this stuff, right? And so when it's warm, it was the mountain kind of secretes it as this black resinous material and indigenous people were seeing uh, native uh, animals and whatnot eating it and that the ones that were eating it were healthier the healthiest ones in the herd right so uh they decided to start consuming it and then they and then it became you know part of their uh, dietary regime and they've been known for uh, health and longevity in those reason regions based on this fulvic and humic acid tea that they make from this stuff so um tastes terrible absolutely terrible but very very good for you <laughs> Growing Cali Dank asking about if it's placebo. Uh, you know, I don't know if it's placebo or not. You know, uh, the plants really seemed to respond, but hey, man, it could have been the aloe. It could have been the water. Who, who knows? Uh, there, there is one truth to that is that the, the mineral content is, is scientifically fact and that, that, it's a, that they are in their ionic forms. Uh, that's, all, that's all undeniable stuff. So um you know i don't know what to say about that one yeah somebody talking about there's a lot of fake shilajee on the market and there really is uh there's you could there's some interesting i this is what i use the i don't know if you could see it Lo, oh it's backwards <laughs> lotus blooming herbs uh they have theirs is a really high quality it will start to dissolve in ice cold water uh, and that's kind of these are our, our properties that you want to see from it uh, if it doesn't dissolve in in cold water or cool water or it's not it doesn't get soft by touching it it acts a lot like uh, shattery bho does when you touch it right? in room temperature it gets kind of cold and pull and snap and in your fingers it immediately gets gooey and soft and that's that's the sign of a really good 
不好意思的就。Oh, so about asking if I ever tried Plant and Prosper Shilaji. I haven't because I've got a 10 gram supply of this Lotus stuff.、Um, but、uh, I know he's he's really hot on his brand, and、uh, I wouldn't mind checking it out. Cool. Uh, cool. Somebody's asking about dynamic accumulators, and I'm glad. I'm glad you did. I, I'm not currently、uh, cultivating any dynamic accumulators from my garden because I'm doing the reamending regime with that kind of keep it simple pack, and that's that's kind of doing a good job at that. Were I to have the space、uh, and kind of、um, or was doing this on a commercial level. I, I most certainly would have a, a section designed specifically for dynamic accumulators. And, excuse me. And those of you that don't know what dynamic accumulators are, these are、um, plants like comfrey and barrage and horsetail that, when planted, they will bring nutrients up into their leaves themselves and then. Uh, store them in the leaf, so you can you, like actually dry the leaf or or make a tea from them, and then pull those nutrients back out of those plants that had dynamically accumulated them, and then introduce them back to the soil.、Um, you could do it could be as simple as just top dressing with you know comfrey leaves or whatever and, and horsetail, or you could grind it up into a powder and use it as a meal. So、uh, dynamic accumulators are are absolute fantastic way. Of delivering nutrients to your plants, and、um, I think it's essential if you scaled up or was doing any kind of homesteading、um, where space isn't necessarily an issue. By all means, dynamic accumulation is where it's at.、Uh, somebody's asking off topic if we're vegan. Yeah, we're, we are vegan,、um, and it's not out of any kind of love. I mean, we love animals, but it's not. It's basically for our health, for health reasons. Um, and、uh, we're not that those holier than thou type, you know. I, I think burgers are delicious. Okay, so I think、uh, I think I've touched about everything that I needed to touch on.、Um, you know,、uh, those are the those are the basic inputs that I use, and that and that's it. You know,、uh, I like to do a lot of foliar spraying、uh, in veg with kelp. And whatnot, and so、uh, that that would I mean that, I don't know if you would consider that an input. I don't call it an input because it's not going to the soil. And then once I start、uh, flowering, I, I cease all the foliar and whatnot. Do you follow the moon cycles for gardening?、Uh, somebody's asking if I follow the moon cycles, like the biodynamic gardening. I don't.、Um, I think it's a really cool concept. And、uh, you know, when I worked in the Co-op world, produce world. We had a lot of really good produce come from bio, biodynamic farms, and so I think there, there's definitely something to it.、Um, I just don't really have the time or energy. I haven't really dove into that. So, so yeah, I guess if nobody's got anything else, I think we're gonna、uh, wrap it up and call it a wrap, call it a show, and I think.、Uh, I'll try to get another one done next Wednesday.、Um, like I said, there's probably probably only do two or three more of these because I want to just cover、uh, a cycle beginning to end, and、uh, that way anybody who wants to kind of tackle this minimalist approach has all the information here in, in digestible chunks.、Uh, thanks a lot, you guys, for coming out. It's like we got another one. I use C90, drink it, give it to my dog. <laughs> I've never heard of C90. But if you can drink it, I say it's good. All right, guys. Well, I'm gonna bounce. Thanks for coming out. I really appreciate you guys' participation and、uh, your positive feedback. And and please, by all means, if you have any more questions or if you watching this and and you have a question about any of the information, leave me a, a question in the comment section. I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. And、uh, be good, everybody.